Good morning from Germany. My name is Claire Cobley, and I am the Editor-in-Chief of Chem Nanomat. I would like to start off by thanking you all for joining us today to celebrate the journal's fifth birthday. I've been with the journal since day one, and it has been so exciting to see Chem Nanomat grow from an idea into the well-established journal that we are celebrating today. Without further ado, I would like to introduce another supporter of the journal since the start, one of the co-chairs of our editorial board, Professor Hu Feng, who will be moderating the symposium and leading the question and answer session today. We're delighted to have him with us today. Hu Sheng, over to you. Okay. Okay, sure, Claire. Okay, uh, hello everyone. This is Hu Sheng uh, Peng speaking from Fudan University based on Beijing time. I would like to say good afternoon. Welcome to the first virtual symposium in honor of the fifth anniversary of Chem 9 Mat. Firstly, I'm glad to introduce this great journal on behalf of editorial board member. Chem 9 Mat publishes both research and review articles on chemistry of nanomaterials and their interdisciplinary applications. It is published on behalf of Asian Chemical Editorial Society and has a wide world authorship and readership. Welcome for submission to this nice journal to show your exciting studies. For this virtual symposium, we have invited three wonderful speakers. Every speaker will talk about the 25 minutes and we may then have about five minutes for discussion after the speech. If the audience have any questions, please leave messages through the online system on the attendance chat. Please remember to add the speak user at sign so the speaker can quickly catch your questions. So the first speaker from Professor Xin Liang Feng. Professor Feng received his PhD at Max Planck Institute for Polymer Research in Germany. He was appointed as a group leader and then distinguished group leader at the same institute. Professor Fong is currently the head of the chair of molecular function materials and technician university uh, director in Germany. He will talk about advances in organic two-dimensional materials today. So Xin, Xin Liang, please. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So, so thank you, uh, Christian, for the introduction and uh, thank and uh, Claria for the invitation. So it's a really great pleasure to, to be here and uh, also meet uh, the, our older friends. And uh, firstly, I'd like to congratulate the chemistry of Lalo Mutia for the successful five years. So I have been fully aware from the starting that uh, the jeweler was established by Claria together with uh, Teresa and now it's uh, in a very uh, good and successful uh, stage. So today I'd like to uh, uh, present uh, the advances in organic to the materials. And uh, uh, this come of course to the, to the word, uh, you know, nowadays that uh, we are talking about the how to, be, to go beyond the graphing. And the uh, graphing has uh, many intrinsic limitations, mostly because of its zero band gap, gap and the semi-mechanical leeches and how to go beyond the graphing, the, strategy is to make a LALO confinement, to introduce the LALO structures for which we can open up the electronic band gap. So the first approach is to, to, to show the, the, the synthetic cu cutout that uh, we, can, uh, we can achieve the so-called uh, uh, LALO graphings. So for this case that uh, we can generate the electronic band gap, but also can tune the interesting electronic, optic electronic and the magnetic properties. And the, these are recent examples that we go to now, the so-called third generation of graphene nanostructures, where we like to have play with the zigzag edges of graphene nano ribbon to tune the magnetic and the spin tronic properties. The second approach that we have been doing quite a lot over the past years is the, is the so-called the the graphing nano ribbons by cutting graphing along the one dimensional nano structures. And here now we play the, with the zigzag edges or curve edges or armchair edges nowadays, and even to generate the topological uh, properties based on the graphing nano ribbons materials. The third approach is to create a pulse. 
how to introduce the, the, the hole inside the graphing. And this directly lead to the pulse graphing or two dimensional polymers and two dimensional conjugated polymers by introducing the pole in graphing and also the hetero uh, atom dopings. Yeah, indeed, the resolution is not uh, very good, but I try to uh, talk as, as what I can. Uh, so, so here, I, I like to refer to the, the, to the polymers, which is defined uh, you know, by our friend, uh, Dieter Schrieder from ETH Zurich, that he redefined the Tody polymer as a single monomer thick atomic defined nanosheet with high order repeating units and on two opposite directions by covalent bonds or non-covalent bonds. And this was the first example that we reported to a dimensional polymer based on the Wurman coupling on the surface directions in, in 2009. And that time, the strategy to deposit the Haskell microcycle compound with the idle substitutions on the gold surface and where the major substrate can provide a 2D confinement, but also the catalytic roles. And high resolution TM allow you to address the intrinsic molecular level and even atomic level structures of the pulse graphing materials. So this is based on the on the on surface synthesis. The next strategy, of course, is called the solution chemistry. And here I like to refer to the two-dimensional conjugated polymers with the uh, important example of the 2D polyphenol vinylene. So the nearly polyphenol vinylene is the first generation conjugate polymers and has been well established and studied for the OLED application in the 1990s. And afterwards, that the, the dream is how to extend the 2D polyvinylene or uh, phenylene vinylene, so your PPV, to, from one dimensional to the two dimensional structures. And here you can see that it's based on the purely sp2 carbonyl structures where you can create the pores of graphing. So what do we learn from this approach based on the Kulivaga polyconcentration reactions of A3, B2 monomers is that the optical band gap of the of the 2D poly, conjugate polymers of the 2D PPV is about the 2.5 EV here, which are in the same range as the pair-connected one-dimensional polyphenylene vinylines. So this, so despite the metal collection of these structures, but they have the similar or comparable band gap with respect to the, the linear polymers. The second uh, information we can learn is that the band gap generally evolves, evolves much faster for the 2D conjugation when compared with the one-dimensional conjugated polymers. So here I'd like, like to come to the, to the 2D material, organic 2D material. Of course, the 2D polymers, if they are in the form of a single layers, they can consider as organic 2D polymers. And here, uh, when we talk about the organic 2D material, firstly, I like to uh, talk about the soft matters, which are defined by Degelas uh, in, in the 1980s, that he defined the, the, the soft matters as a material which can be easily uh, thermally uh, deformed or uh, similarly depressed by the thermal fractionations at the bottom room temperature. And the typically soft matters are the amorphous material or less crystalline materials. They do not show the crystallinity or the non ranger ordering. And by this definition, the 2D soft matter, which I just, uh, I did not invent anything new, but just to put the 2D in front of soft matters that they can include the graphene oxide or super molecular organelle structures by the same several assembly of amphiphoric colloidals uh, surfactant the crystals. And here, what we talk about organic 2D material that we refer to it as a crystalline materials with a high structured orderings. And the following this definition, the organic 2D material can include the synthetic graphings, the 2D polymers, super polymers, the boron carbon lattice lat lat sheet, and then single filial 2D covalent organic framework, metal organic framework, and uh, even a crystalline polymer nano sheet. And these are the typical examples, which I will not uh, go to the uh, details. Okay, I think the resolution is uh, still not so <laughs> so good. Maybe you can uh, improve a little bit uh, in the backside. So, and here I'd like to uh, introduce the interface as a synthetic platform for the organic 2D materials. And here, the interface, we refer to the liquid air interface or the liquid liquid interface for the interfacial polymerizations. And typically, that the 2D 
interface are formed as a liquid air or air water or liquid interface. They are very sharp, they are smooth, and they can provide the 2D confinement geometry for the controlled polarization. Eventually, we can get a freestanding atomically thin nanosheet material, which we can refer to the to the polymers with the controlled molecular design and the polymerizations. And compared to the bulk reactions, that this kind of interface allow you to tune the surface roughly, control the molecular orientation, the molecular interactions, and the even enhance chemical reactivity, which I can talk about afterwards. Some reactions which can not take place in the conventional solution synthesis, but can, can, be, can occur at the interface, such as the air water interface. And the first approach is to use the air water interface by using non blotted approach. And here the typical strategy is that you spread the monomers on the water surface, you can compress into the uh, stacked order the model layers, and you can inject a second monomer in the water phase, which can trigger the 2D positions. And eventually you can just uh, transfer the 2D polymers with a single layer by the vertical or horizontal deposition pathways. You can fish it and you can deposit other substrates for the calculations. So the first uh, example which I will briefly talk about is the 2D correlation polymer with conjugated structures based on hexacyl trifenylene and with different metal salts like nickel, iron, copper. And this uh, field has been well established by our group leader, Dr. Ronghao Dong, who is a hero in the 2D conjugated polymers. And this material had a fully high conjugated structure with the interesting optical, electronic, and the magnetic properties. So by using the approach, he can create the large area model layer to the supermolecular polymers or correlation polymers with a thickness of 0 0.7 nanometers, and this can be really defined as a single layer structures. So this material, they are mechanically flexible but stable. So you can deposit on the TM grade that they are transparent, they are mechanically stable, and by using high resolution TM, you can get the unit size, you can find the local crystallinities. So this unit size corresponding to 2.0 nanometer, which I agree what what you expect for the single layer to the polymers. And of course, you can deposit the model layer, bilayer, and the transfer multi layers. So by using this approach, that he can further extend to the liquid liquid interface, such as the water with the chloroform interface, and there you can create the more multi-layer materials. So here you can achieve the tunable film thickness from 10 nanometers or even uh, micrometers with the thick films, okay, from multi-layer to thick films, but you can make fabricate large areas up to centimeter square size with these materials. And this material is actually very interesting electronic materials. So by using photo connectivity with the terahertz time resolved spectroscopy method, you can uh, you can achieve the real connectivity as a function of the pump probe delays. So where you can derive the lifetime of 20 picoseconds. And this value is much higher than any linear conjugated polymers and the conjugated oligomers. So this result suggests that you can get a much higher charge can mobility from these materials. So by further uh, uh, function probe the conductivity as a function of the frequency, you can get the uh, real conductivity and there you can fit it and you can derive the drudal fitting and the drudal response band like transport behavior. So here you can get the scaling time of 20, uh, two for a seconds, and uh, by using this you can equation, you can achieve the charge can mobility about the 220 centimeter square per second. And this value is much higher than many, many conjugated polymers and uh, other conjugated ma materials. So here, this go to the, the word of the 2D conjugated metal organic framework for the morphic electronics. So I will not go to detail just to show you that uh, you can design different type of monomers. You can go to the in important structure features and you can exploit important functional properties. Okay, now the quality is, is a pretty bad actually. I cannot see the slide even myself. Okay, I hope it will be um, better in the next slide. Okay, then uh, we can further extend to the to the uh, to the supermolecular polymers at the liquid liquid interface. So here, by using the host gas enhanced supermolecular interactions of the dual acceptors, okay, dual acceptor interactions. So we design the ACC3 symmetric dual molecule with the methane uh, substituted lofting unit, and the acceptor is a hydrogen unit. So they can have the strong association constants in the host of the CD unit. 
And these two monomers, one is soluble in the water phase together with the CD, and another is, is soluble in the organic phase. So by using this, we can uh, synthesize the A3 B2 polymerization, supermolecular polymerization of the single layer 2D supermolecular polymers. So going to the 2D covalent polymers, so here is an example that we, we rely on the dynamic covalent chemistry. So it's the shift-based reactions which have been popularly used for the, for the covalent organic framework chemistry. So we designed a 3 b 2 polymerization at the air water liquid interface. And for that, we can, by using non covalent broad approach, we can also fabricate a large airway single layer 2D polymer with a very good crystallinities. So by using the liquid liquid interface, you can you can get the multi-layer 2D covalent polymer films. So I have a lot of good details. So these are rely on the established uh, water interface and the liquid water interface. So here I like to talk about a uh, different type of interfacial chemistry and uh, these are based on surfactants. So whether the surfactant and bilayers, and uh, this can be defined also as the all the surface of bilayers and the inner surface of bilayers. So we can use the surface bilayer to add a template to do a lot of interesting and templating chemistries. But here I like to focus on the surfactant and the monolayer assisted interfacial synthesis. So the idea is that you can spread the model, so surfactant monolayer as a water interface, okay? And they can align, they can organize with all the structure by the surfactants. And uh, afterwards, you can deposit, you can inject the monomers into the water phase so they can be absorbed on the surfactant monolayer underneath the surfactant water monolayer. They can uh, co-assembly and they can start the nucleation and the trigger the 2D polymerization once the second monomer is added. So eventually you can prepare to from few layer to multi layer to the polymer crystals with after the removal of the surfactant monolayers. So this is the work that we have been doing over the last few years. And this was the first work published last year that using the, this so-called SMICE method for the 2D uh, polymer crystals. And here we like to use the analysis surfactant with which can be complementary to the charged molecules. They can control the they can guide the supermolecular organization of the 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 uh, uh, charged the catanic molecules under on the water surface. And the ration we like to uh, exploit firstly for the emide ration and the amide ration because if you are the polymer chemist, you know these are very popular uh, chemistry for the polymerization rations like polyemide and polyamide. And typically such a ration require the high temperature treatment in the in the solutions. And in this case, we find, we discover that such a reaction can be directly uh, 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 take, a place, take a place at the room temperature. So we took the commercial uh, type of monomers with the A4B2 monomer designs, okay, with the, with the buffering, with the four amino substitutions and the pairing dianhydride or the bending dianhydride, with, which result into this shaped 2D polyimide and the and also the 2D polyamide with hierarchical porous structures. To understand the direction, how it can take place and whether it can take place on the water surface. So we first exploit the model reactions with the model amino substitutions with the dianhydride. And we find that in the aqueous solution, okay, you leave the left direction for two days at the pH of five, for example, nothing happens. You only get the monomers, okay? But on the water surface, under the SMICE conditions, with the same condition, that in a few hours, the, all the monomer have been converted to the imide compound. So this suggests that uh, the imide reaction can successfully take place on the water surface at room temperature with a high efficiency. So this result is a very, uh, yeah, very encouraging for us that this suggests that 2D polymerization can work under the water surface using smite conditions. So this is the mechanism that we proposed for the these pH conditions. So I will not go into detail, just to, want to point out that the, at the pH of five, the anhydride can, can hydrolyze into diacid, and these are crucial to promote the reactions for the EMI reaction uh, to take place. So afterwards, we got a lot of 2D polymer crystals with a micrometer size that you can see here. We can get a large area film, which are flexible, but the, the film that you can get more than 60, 70% of single crystal structures with a large area domain size. And the high resolution TM allow you to resolve this molecular structure of 2D polymer crystals at the molecular level. And here, this is the high resolution TM images, which exactly show that the square lattice 
of these uh, twenty polymer crystals with the the lattice unit size of uh, AB three nanometers, which are fully agreement what uh, we can expect from these twenty uh, polymer crystals. And you can count that many different size of, of uh, crystals you can get uh, achieve the average single crystalline domain size of 3.5 micrometers square. And uh, you can look at the high resolution TM with the scattering, you can find uh, all the areas show the same electron diffractions. So this, so this suggests the single crystal leaches. So based on the average crystal size, we can derive the molecular weight, okay? It's about 10 to 0.8 gram per mole. And this molecular weight is at least two orders higher than the any synthetic, any synthetic linear polymers. Okay, uh, discovered so far. So, so this also suggests that the 2D polymerization is a very important approach to promote the, the high molecular weight for the polymer chemistry. So then we try to further understand what's the role of the sweat monolayer that they can guide the supermolecular organizations. So we investigate the monomers under the sweat monolayer guidization before and after polymerizations. So before polymerization, we find it already highly ordered structure from the X-ray diffractions, and you can see from the left and also from the right, the red lines of the puffing assemblies. And uh, after polymerization for the 2D polymer, we show the very comparable ordering structures. So this is very also encouraging to understand that uh, the sweat monolayer is really efficient to guide the supermolecular operation of the 2D monomers already in the highly crystalline state. And the high resolution team also shows that the porphyrin monomer itself has a very high periodic structures. So I will not go into details. And uh, later we can, of course, extend this uh, to the 2D polyamide. We can get the unit size, different unit size with the dual pore structure here. I will not go into details. And then the question come afterwards is, uh, you know, whether you can control the organization of the molecules, whether it's, uh, uh, whether it's vertically arranged on the surface or whether it's, uh, it's, uh, it's horizontally aligned on the, on the surface. And this would uh, have been a bigger challenge over 10 years ago for the discordic molecular assembly on the, on the, surface, on the surface. It's at that time very easy to get the vertical alignment of the molecule on the, on the sub substrate, which it has the right configuration for the field effect transistors. And, and, uh, but to have a horizontal alignment is much challenging. And in our case, we can easily get a horizontal alignment of the molecules, the monomers on the surface or on the substrate, okay? And the question is whether can we achieve the, uh, the vertical alignment? And the answer, of course, is yes, we can do it. So by using the carboxylic acid surfactant, we can graft the monomers, okay, covalently on the water surface, which are vertically to the water surface. And by this way, we can guide the supermolecular organization of the, all the monomers aligned in similar directions. So by using this approach, we could achieve the vertical growth of the 2D polymer, um, uh, polyamide, which had the same unit size lattice. As the, as the horizontal alignment to the polymer, uh, polyamide, for example. So this chemistry uh, can be easily extended to many other uh, polymerizations for the 2D polymer synthesis. So of course, we can extend to the, to the, to the 2D polyamines. You can use a different monomer combination with the different geometries. So here in this way, can, we can get the square shaped 2D polyamines with the different unit size of the uh, 15 nanometers at the, at the, in the water surface without any catalysis, for example. And uh, by using the catalysis, we can even improve the crystal size I will show you in the next slide. So here is a morphology of the 2D polyamine films. We can also fabricate the large areas even after waffle uh, size scales. And the and time dependent TM imaging show that the, the 2D crystal uh, formation process is started from nucleation and the coalescence of the small crystal into the larger uh, crystalline films in this case. So by using the Lewis acid. So here the yttrium uh, truffulate, which is water tolerant uh, Lewis acid. And, uh, and for that, they can enhance the reversibility of the imine reactions by using Lewis acid catalyst. Okay. And in this way, we can get the molecular resolved highly crystalline polyamine film with a domain size of 150 nanometer, uh, uh, nanometers, which are three times larger than that without, without using any catalyst. 
And the further we can also even in control the pH, uh, control uh, midi directions, and here by using triphenyl acid, we can get a single crystal uh, uh, films of the 2D polyamine with a crystal size of one to uh, five micrometers. And here we show the near atomic level resolution of the 2D polymer for the first time. And here you can even go to the green bondings, green and the age structures, those pretty like any inorganic 2D material. You can all get all this information of ages, green bondings with the different geometry and the compositions. So I will not go to details just to save the time. I think I will quickly go to the last two examples. And the next example, we can also use the board Easter uh, 2D polymer film by the Smith method. And uh, for there we can and get the crystal size of the 60 mic micrometers square, you know, you with the tunable thickness from 6 to uh, 16 nanometers. And we find that the broad Easter film consisting of porphyrin unit can be quite interesting for the neuromorphic uh, memory device. So this is a prototype device which is the most com compatible and it can be to mimic, mimic the neuro neuromorphic computing process, for example. So the last uh, example, I will go to the, the 2D polyanine conducting polymers. So here, uh, uh, so here we find the, the 2D super polyanine film with high crystallinity can be up to wafer scale size, can be uh, synthesized by using a SMICE method. So without going to the details, I will just want to uh, quickly go to the last slide. So we also have the spectroscopic acquisitions of these 2D polyanine uh, films. And uh, again, we can get the near atom atomic or molecular level resolution of the linear polyanine for the first time. So this is a polyanine even is reported, predicted to be the linear structure, but uh, there are no real molecular level confirmations. And using our strategy, we can clearly show that the molecular level resolution of linear polyanine, we can derive the molecular weight about the 10 to 0.8 gram per mole against three orders higher than solution produced polyanine. And this uh, polyanine film should an anisotropic charge transport with record electric conductivity up to 160 zimmer per centimeters. And they can be used for uh, sensing uh, application, for example. So with this, I'd like to conclude uh, my presentation. So I uh, hope I show you the, the, the interfacial synthesis and organic 2D materials, which offer many possibilities for developing interesting 2D polymers, super polymer, and also single to fuel to cough morph materials and the super molecular and crystalline polymer structures. And there are a lot of chemistry and need to be discovered both for interfacial chemistry and also for the, uh, the molecular level synthetic chemistry. And there are many interesting materials still need to be, to be established or discovered for different applications. So with this, I'd like to uh, conclude and I'd like to thank my group for sure this, I don't do any laboratory work nowadays, and this all need to go to the group members, like uh, including Ron Hao Dong, the driver for the interfacial chemistry and uh, to the morph electronics, the former group member, like uh, Dr. Shaofa Dong, who is now professor in, in Shanghai, Martin Professorman, and Ji Kun is a professor in the Guangzhou, in Zhongshan University, and uh, Kevin and Tao need to be mentioned, uh, and also Park to be mentioned for this work. And finally, I'd like to thank also my uh, collaboration partners for their outstanding contributions, like Dieter Schlitter and the Rehema, Thomas Heiner from Dresden, the Kaiser from Worm, and uh, uh, also the Kulibeti from Dresden, and the Ferry, and uh, Stefan Masvi, and also financial support. And finally, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you much, and I'm looking forward to further discussion with you. Thank you. Oh, okay, okay, thank you, Xinyang. Okay, okay, very nice talk. Okay, so uh, we may have time for one to two small questions. Uh, Shina, please uh, look at the uh, one question from the audience. Okay. Uh, uh, from Luper Riger, you can see the question. Uh, okay, okay, from Kalari, the question, right? Uh, yes. So how difficult is it to get this with your organic to the material using the TM? Yes, this is typically not so easy. It's very challenging. And that's the reason that we are able to make a significant progress over the last few years by using high-resolution TM for the organic material. So typically organic material, if they are a single layer and with hydrogen, okay, organic material always have hydrogen, and they are not stable by against the electron Irradiation, okay, they easily burnt out. And by using 
the, our approach, we can get a highly crystalline, you know, to the polymers and especially with the few layer structure, these are, you know, allow us the opportunity to get, to get the molecular level resolved the structures by using the TM. And another strategy that we developed uh, together with the worm group is to using the two graphing layer to send the wish the, to the polymer, okay, with a single layer structure. And the graphing is very stable against the electron irradiation under TM condition. So by using that method, it's also possible to get the, the structures out of the single layer organic material for the, from the TM. Uh, so there is a second question from Eric Yi Wow. Okay. Okay, so yes, yeah, Ruben question. So uh, for your surface polymerization reaction, can you talk more about the substrate scope of the reactions? So basically we don't use any substrate. So we did everything on the water surface as a, what I showed today, on the water surface or on the water liquid interface. So they are directly you know, freestanding in a way because water is very soft, it is mobile, right? So you can just uh, use any substrate to fish it. You can transfer uh, the material, okay, single layer, few layer material from the water surface to other substrate. And we just need to, need to wash out the surfactant or the, or, the, or the solvent, you know, this is uh, what uh, we can do. We don't need to uh, have any, we don't have any problem with the substrate there. Okay, so now uh, it's a time, and uh, okay. in fact, there is one more question from the audience. Then please uh, reply uh, uh, in the system by uh, by just uh, input the uh, uh, the text. Okay, so uh, uh, it's a time for the first speaker, and thank, thank you, Sina, again for the wonderful talk. So then we will move to the second speaker, uh, Professor Michael Peter Risse. Uh, Professor Titerissa obtained her PhD from the University of Dortmund in Germany. She then uh, worked at the Max Planck Institute of Clothes at the Interfaces, Queen Mary University of London, and currently Imperial College in London. She takes up a chair in sustainable energy materials. She will talk about the break is the, the new green sustainable carbon for energy storage and conversion. So please join me to warmly welcome home for the speech. Okay, please. Hi, hello. Thank you uh, very much for the introduction. I hope everyone can hear me well. So I would like to start my talk uh, by, of course, wishing a warm, very happy anniversary to uh, Chem Nanomart, so five years. And I'm very happy to be on board and, and supporting the journal and being part of the um, editorial board. Um, today, I just want to tell you a little bit about what we are doing in, in our group uh, on sustainable materials for energy storage and conversion. And so I will start by um, telling you a little bit about this big challenge that we have today, which is to address this energy trilemma. How can we actually balance energy cost and efficiency with minimum or no CO2 emissions while also addressing the security of energy supply? And I believe that in the center of all this, we need to put the environmental sustainability because this is the only way forward that we can uh, progress. Uh, probably a lot of you know this, especially if some of you um, 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 have seen my talks before. Um, this is the list of critical materials published by the European Union. And you see that everything that is in this box above here is considered to be a critical element. And these are very important materials, metals, that we are currently used to build our renewable energy technologies. Um, so just to give you some examples, of course, if we want to do uh, wind turbines, we are relying heavily on these rare earths, and these are extremely, extremely rare elements. With the development of batteries, we are mining cobalt, and also uh, which is part of the cathode material in a normal lithium ion batteries, um, and uh, also uh, graphite, which goes into the anode. And there's 
start to be significant problems with these two elements, in particular with um, cobalt, which is uh, from the Democratic Republic of Congo, is mine unsustainable. Graphite is now also a critical element uh, uh, by the European Union, in particular in relation with its, its availability in the EU. Same with fuel cells and electrolyzer that we use to either make clean hydrogen from water or convert the hydrogen into electricity. They rely on platinum or iridium as catalyst. And again, these are very scarce elements. And similar with fuel cells, we use indium, gallium, tellurium. So we have a big challenge to address for the future, and we need to really learn how not to make the same mistakes as we did in the past. And if we are to implement these technologies, we need to think of sustainability. So this is a picture that my group drew for me. I'm just showing you here because it's, it's quite funny, but it kind of says what we are doing in our group. So we're trying to bridge this gap between the material supply and availability of materials and how can we build future emerging energy technologies so that we can um, do them in a sustainable manner. So at the same time, we have a lot of uh, resources and these are some numbers that I gave for the European Union. So we have a lot of waste available, all sorts of bio waste from food waste to plastic and packaging, um, agricultural waste, forestry waste, for example, glycerol, which is a, a, a secondary waste from biodiesel production, sewage sludge, algae, and so on. Now, this is a tremendously important resource, and there are technologies um, um, developed to extract valuable components from this waste. And when I talk about these valuable components, we can think of... Um, Things that I put here, lignin, chitosan, cellulose, chitin, tannin, waxes, natural bilipids. And so why don't we base our future material production on this type of very valuable resources that I couldn't extract from waste? And with this, we can help uh, the EU reach his um, uh, green deal and get to hopefully zero emissions by, by 2050, as well as help transition towards a zero waste economy. So in my group, we are taking those highly available resources that we can make from waste and using um, natural inspiration, we're trying to convert this into well-defined nanostructured materials. And then with this sustainable nature inspired materials, we're trying to implement them in renewable energy technology, such as making more sustainable batteries, finding new ways of producing hydrogen without using expensive materials, as well as enabling platinum-free fuel cells. Now, I don't know if I will have time to go through all these technologies, because I always talk too much and I promise to be on time, so we'll see uh, how much we can do. But but before I start, um, I just want to tell you a little bit of a few techniques that we use to enable the production of these sustainable materials from waste. And one of this is something that I'm working for a very, very long time now, uh, which is hydrothermal carbonization. And um, this can rely on biomass, bio waste. We tend to start with those defined precursors that, that we extract from bio waste, but we are also looking at real waste, which will be be more valuable. However, some problems with reproducibility will occur. And also, although in a different chemistry process, we're trying also now at converting plastic waste into nanostructured carbon materials via this hydrothermal process. This is a very versatile process because along with uh, carbon materials that you can make and use in all these applications, electrocatalysis, batteries, adsorption, and so on, you also produce another category of materials, which are some very interesting fluorescent materials called, in the literature, carbon dots. However, they're quite different from the way you make them. And we are particularly investigating these hydrothermal carbons that we form at the same time with the nanostructure carbon during this process. So looking at why do they fluoresce, um, can we use this as the next generation of photocatalyst? And also within the same batch process, 
We also, because everything happens in water uh, under subcritical conditions, once you have isolated the nanostructure carbons by filtration and the carbon dose by centrifugation, you end up with an aqueous phase. And if you look in this aqueous phase, you'll find some very important chemicals as well. I can mention uh, things like levulinic acid or hydroxymethyl furfural. And so these are also very interesting chemicals to build future polymers, bio-based polymers, biodegradable polymers, but also binders in batteries and things like this. Now, the quality of my slide went really, really bad, so I almost can't see anything. I hope you can see better than me. Um, the second way we're taking this type of biomass precursor and convert them into useful uh, materials is using electrospinning. And what we do here is we mainly use lignin, which is the second component of biomass, uh, main component. So biomass has cellulose and hemicellulose, and those can be easily converted via this hydrothermal process. I showed them previous slides. Now with lignin, what we do is we electrospin it into lignin fiber mats. We can control this, so we can um, really nicely control the fiber diameter, their porosity, we can hybridize them with other materials, and then we can carbonize so that we have some sustainable conductive carbon fiber mats, which have conductivity, but also we can engineer this with the right flexibility. And so there is a picture here. And with this lignin derived um, carbon fibers, we're trying to build um, the future energy storage and conversion devices which will be flexible. So we're using a solid gel electrolyte here and we're using no current collector. So we're trying to produce flexible structural energy storage. So for example, you could imagine that in the future we might not have the battery in the back of your car or in the back of your laptop, but just the entire car or the entire laptop would be made out of your battery that would also give mechanical structure to your car or your laptop. So that's something else that, that we're working on into the group. Um, some of these uh, materials that we prepare either via hydrothermal carbonization or via electrospinning that I said we can do with very different morphologies and that's something that we know to control very well so we can make uh, ordered porous carbon, tubular carbon, hierarchical carbon spheres, uh, and so on. We are also using now new uh, manufacturing techniques, in particular 3D printing and electrolyting to process this a little bit better into the flexible devices of the future. So 3D printed batteries or, or supercapacitors. Um, um, and that's uh, some new activities that, that we just started in, in our group. Now I will tell you a little bit uh, about how we take the sustainable nature inspired materials and we use them to build, in this case, greener batteries. Um, so we all know that, of course, lithium ion batteries is our technology of choice for, um, for energy storage. And we are currently using this in electrical vehicles, portable electronics, and all the battery industry loves lithium ion batteries. Um, um, you know, the, the great news is that they finally got a Nobel Prize, uh, which made me very happy. Um, and as I said, they are really widely used across the board. Um, however, the question is, are we doing really the right thing with lithium ion batteries? Yes, we've made great progress. Yes, now industry is on board with this, but are they really sustainable? And Again, unfortunately, I can't really see my own slides, which doesn't really help presenting them. Um, but um, I took this image from the World Economic Forum, but in order to present it, I like to see it, and I can't. Um, unfortunately, that's that's the, the, the trick with doing webinars. But actually, um, I think... Um, this slide, I think I, I will need to open my own presentation to, to go through this separately on my computer. Uh, 
Okay, so I think what this uh, slide actually shows is that the battery production has significant CO2 footprints, which is mainly driven by active materials and other components, as well as the cell production. And it really shows that lithium ion batteries emit around um, 24 megatons of CO2 equivalent. That was in 2008, and it also shows um, which countries, which are the biggest producer in, of batteries, are more responsible for, for this and also where the CO2 emissions come from. And they come from mo mostly mining the raw materials and raw materials refactoring, uh, as well as from other active materials and their significant CO2 from pack production. Um, so this shows that things are per perhaps not as great with uh, lithium ion batteries as we would like them to be. Um, and also the next slides, I showed that there is a big problem with the battery supply chain um, as, as this is um, not so widely available um, in, in Europe and we rely on these materials that are elsewhere distributed. And this is uh, another thing that I can't see very well, which I took from the World Economic Forum um, showing, um, again, I need to look at my real size because I, I can't really read the slides from, from the screen. Hmm. Um, yeah, so it shows the raw material demand in kilogram per annum, and it shows how much cobalt we needed by 2018, but also shows the predicted amounts of cobalt by 2030, and so it does for lithium, nickel, and manganese. And you could see that, according to this analysis, the demand of raw materials will drastically increase, which will put supply uh, chain in lithium-ion batteries at, at high risk. So... What we do in my group is we want to move away from, let's say, lithium ion batteries and diversify the battery chemistries and the supply chain and try to build batteries with more abundant and sustainable elements. And I think if we want to have batteries for the next and next and next generations to come, this is the way we have to do it. We have to think of new batteries chemistry using more abundant elements. We need to think how to get the performance high, same or even superior to what lithium ion batteries is doing. And we also try to think of how we can recover um, these more precious materials from batteries and recycle them properly. So as I said in our group, we are doing a lot of uh, battery sustainability. We're looking also at life cycle assessment and trying to understand, um, you know, if all this new chemistry that we've built are truly successful, su uh, sustainable, and we're also looking at the next generation of batteries beyond lithium that will do alternative chemistries. Um, so um, this was also luckily also recognized by the European Union, and there is this Battery 2030 roadmap, which exactly uh, suggests the same vision as, as I am having, is that if we want in the future for Europe at least, but also globally to be relying on batteries, we really need to address some of these challenges in relation with raw material supply, better manufacturing and recycling. Um, so in terms of more sustainable battery options, I'll just show you the ones that we are currently studying in our group. We are um, doing a lot of sodium and potassium ion batteries, which um, are going to be much lower cost than lithium ion batteries and they rely on sustainable materials. Uh, in order to increase the energy density, we're trying to borrow from lithium ion batteries and try to apply alloys or uh, pairing with sulfur cathodes for this sodium and potassium chemistry. We're also lo looking at magnesium chemistries. In terms of power density, we're trying to address that by developing dual batteries and hybrid system, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. And we're also trying to address durability and safety of the battery by developing solid-state electrolytes, but again, trying to move away from this really 
rigid ceramic electrolytes and trying to go more into sustainable polymer electrolytes or polymer binders. So um, these are just a few examples here from my group. Um, and this is a sodium battery supercapacitor hybrid that we've built entirely from cellulose. And so what we have here is we have a cellulose derived hard carbon as the um, as the um, anode and we have a porous carbon as the cathode and in between we have a cellulose gel electrolyte. And the way this works is that we use sodium or potassium ions which can intercalate into the hard carbon and then the anions from the salt that we're using in the electrolyte which um, in this case is perchlorate can go into and intercalate into the porous carbon uh, anode and we are balancing here between energy and power. So um, this would be a very low cost technology for application in which the energy density is not so crucial, but we want um, fast charging power and we want these materials to work for, for many, many cycles. Now, in terms of uh, dual ion batteries, uh, we're also working on this and you could have here different configurations. You could have a dual cation configuration where you have two uh, cations. So, for example, you could have sodium and potassium or sodium and lithium. And a pole charging sodium migrates um, to the electrolyte from the cathode where lithium or potassium migrates to the anode from the electrolyte. And on the discharge, the opposite happens, which means sodium moves back to the cathode while lithium and potassium moves back to the electrolyte. We're also developing the cation and ion mode where you have uh, one solution of the electrolyte between the electrodes and upon charge the electrolyte is depleted of ions, um, uh, cations to the anode and anions to the cathode. And here the challenge is to get really a high operating voltage on your cathode, which in this case is graphite. So we're looking at different combinations of electrolytes to really get this high power but operating a really high voltage here and we're using ionic liquids combinations with sodium and potassium to enable this. Um, as I said, we're also looking at potassium ion batteries uh, where again, the challenge is to find um, suitable anode. Graphite doesn't work that well. So we're developing all these carbon materials and trying to fundamentally understand the intercalation of potassium ion and we're also looking at um, um, developing better cathode materials, uh, Prussian blue type of materials. Um, the old lithium sulfur battery is still around, so we're, we're also still trying to address some challenges here along with a few of my colleagues from the UK via the Faraday Institution Challenge in the Star project. So we're trying here really to minimize um, the carbon matrix uh, where the sulfur unload and maximize the amount of sulfur and try to have smarter ways uh, in adding uh, electrocatalysts to help these polysulfide conversions. And we're trying to compare the lithium sulfur batteries with sodium sulfur room temperature batteries and try to learn from one each other. Um, in terms of more solid electrolytes, what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop biopolymers that we chemically modify with functional groups that can have conductivity for sodium and potassium. And this is also to potentially enable of using um, directly metallic sodium and metallic potassium into batteries. Um, and so this uh, electrolytes will give you the possibility of being more flexible compared to the Nasicon current um, electrolytes that are using. And you also have the possibility to functionalize these electrolytes with really smart functions, such as, for example, um, self-healing materials, which can cure the battery during the operation. And so this is another activity that we're doing uh, into my group. But, um, I would like to tell you a little bit more in details a bit about our work on sodium ion batteries, which in my opinion is the next technology to be 
commercialized in respect to, to uh, lithium. And so this is because the sodium ion batteries operates very similar to uh, lithium ion batteries. However, the differences are a lot into the anode where unlike lithium, which intercalates very nicely into graphite, sodium doesn't. And the reason why sodium doesn't intercalate into graphite, it's very, very complicated. And I could have another five webinars just to talk about this, but I want it's just not the size of the sodium. There's a lot of other thermodynamics. And if you are interested in all the story of the differences between these intercalation compounds, I invite you to look at our recent chemical society review where we are explaining this. Um, so anyway, because sodium doesn't go into graphite, we're trying to develop really high energy storage capacity anodes based on our carbons, which uh, I guess you know that there are materials that have still graphitic domains, but they're very, very disordered to one each other. Um, and so if you look at the profile of a sodium ion batteries, what you will see is the typical slope here. It started at high voltages. And when you go here to almost zero volts, you would start seeing a plateau. So now we're trying to really understand and maximize the capacity, both in the slope, which is supposed to be because of the intercalation or absorption of sodium at the graphitic domains, and the plateau domain, which is um, which is due to um, um, some sort of poor filling of sodium into these materials, and so there are a lot of theories in the literature um, on this um, sodium intercalation mechanism, and I'll try to um, give you our own story on this. So again, we're using this hydrothermal carbonization where we take some waste materials, in this case. Uh, glucose and we carbonize it at low temperature into hydrothermal carbon, which then we carbonize further at temperatures between 1000 and um, 2000 degrees. And so this is the morphology of our carbon material. See, there are spherical particles. We can improve the morphology and the uniformity of these materials. We've learned how to do this. And then you could, of course, characterize these materials. Um, you can have standard things like, um, again, I can't really read my own slides, unfortunately, which doesn't help presenting them properly. Uh, I guess this is just the temperature, different temperatures that we have the materials. Oh, it's getting even worse. Um, um, anyway, what we see is that, of course, by having higher temperature, we can increase the level of graphitization. Um, uh, this is not easy to, <laughs> to present slides. Um, I guess this is small angle X-ray scattering, which is a very powerful technique because it can tell you about atomic distances and it can also tell you about um, how the way these materials are packed in a battery. And we, <sighs> I, I think, uh, I, I don't know if you can actually see my slides because I really don't see, so perhaps I just skip the details because there's no point presenting something so detailed when when I can't really see the slides. These are some payer distribution function that we're also doing at Synchrotron to really understand the ratio between five carbons and six carbons and also try to understand the connectivity in between these this five and six carbon materials and uh, trying to look at the ratio of um, soft carbon versus graphitic carbon and the five membranes versus six membranes. Um, again, this is porosity. And if you look at the porosity from nitrogen and CO2 absorption and you combine this with data from small angle X-ray scattering, you could figure out the amount of closed pores and the amount of open pores that you have in each of this material, which is of crucial importance for sodium ion batteries. And so this is really showing this graph that you can probably not see shows 
the ratios of uh, closed versus open pores. And we're trying to then correlate all these properties of the sodium ion batteries with the electrochemistry. So you could see here, this is... Oof, we make it that we have long over the time. Did we? Yeah, please. In, in, in I really told, yeah, <laughs> okay. I just took 25 minutes, I'm, I'm counting it. Um, okay. Anyway, I'm sorry that you, you really can't see my slides. This is um, not the best way <laughs> to give a presentation. Um, so I'll try to go to the end of this talk, uh, but I don't know how. Can you someone help me go on the last slide here of my talk? Because I can't control my slides and I have quite a lot of slides. Just see if you can go to the very last slide so I can finish this. Yes, okay, so um, unfortunately, as I said, um, it's just the quality of my slides is, is not great, so I almost can't read my own slides. But um, yeah, I just wanted to give you an insight of the fact that we are developing all this new battery chemistry and we're also trying to really look into the fundamentals of all of this. And in terms of hydrogen, I didn't have time to, to, to tell you, but what we're doing in my group is trying to use also biomass, bio waste to produce, generate green hydrogen with co-production of chemicals. And again, trying to introduce uh, nitrogen iron dot carbons into fuel cell. And we're looking now at single metal sites versus dual metal sites and trying also to understand the difference in oxygen reduction reactions. So with this, I would like to thank my research group and all the funding. Please start with the next speaker. Good afternoon from Asia and good morning from Europe and also uh, from US. Could be very early morning or even midnight. Yeah, uh, very my pleasure to be to be here to to share something what we are doing in terms of material science design thinking for the ultra fast rechargeable lithium battery. I apologize very much for a technical problem. You know, even myself, I didn't realize it work, it doesn't work just now. But I hope it works now. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Um, and uh, I try to, in the next 25 minutes, I try to show you with you what we are doing in terms of the lithium battery, especially for fast charging lithium battery work. In fact, for electrical chemical battery technology, so this, in fact, is a very old topic. In terms of science, there are more than 200 years ago already. And also in the last 200 years, there are different kinds of battery have been developed from the lead AC battery until sodium sulfur battery. You can see even a lithium metal battery. This was developed in 1972. But of course, today you can see a lot of research focused on the lithium metal battery today. And then what I'm going to share with you today is another topic. So lithium ion batteries. This is something what we know already. In last last two, last year, the Nobel laureate finally went to the good enough and the other two people together in, for the discovery, the lithium batteries. But I want to mention one point for lithium batteries. In fact, in this development process, exactly it's one example how the materials develop, discovery and also development is very really important to improve the performance of the battery, whatever from the energy storage device in, in terms of like energy density and also this kind of charging time and also the power density. So this is something one how materials science or materials engineering can really help. And one um, of course, in fact, this clear some better. I would say in, in today we are, we are really elderly, but it's outdated everyone already for a laptop, for a smartphone, and so on. But still, there are few challenges. So one particular challenge is, is about fast charging. So Still, something one like I would say, you know, today, especially, you know, people are not really patient than before. So that's something like we want. Can we have this kind of charging capability, like this kind of in few a few minutes? It can be at least get, get some, some certain some charge already. So this something like I would say is really kind of a political question. But of course, in academic still or in industry, still different people, different people have different opinion, especially for lithium batteries, especially go for fast charging. 
is always it's got overheat problem. Uh, no doubt, this if you really go for a vehicle, you, this kind of e this kind of e vehicle, this really problem. But when when, when back, if you go for this kind of the smallest kind of the energy capacity device like this kind of smartphone or this kind of you know, hearing aids and so on, I would say fast charging is really help a lot. So this is something one I want to share with everyone. And then of course, so that's something about entire important of fast charging. But of course, for the smart grid, in some particular case, they also may need this kind of fast charging capabilities. So that's why we are really the optimal. I mean, this kind of want to really motivate us a lot. How can we develop this kind of fast charging materials? You know, theoretically, we know already the energy density of a current lithium batteries. I mean, it's really decreased dramatically with a high current rate. This is something that one, no one really can help to really say no. But for material science, one angle we can do is, can we delay such a process? I will not say not so dramatically decrease, but can this decrease a bit slowly? But it's still possible to have this kind of fast charging capability. So this is something we are really looking forward. How can we do this one? And then from material perspective, you want to give up. Now we must understand him. what's really principle for this kind of rapid charging and discharging process, what's really important process. So in these slides, in fact, I show you the four critical steps during this kind of rapid discharging process, how this kind of lithium ions and also electron from dissociation from anodes, materials, and then um, go to the different interface from this kind of electrolyte, electro interface, and then diffuse through to electrolyte into this kind of uh, cathode electrodes. So this is something uh, for critical step in this kind of lithium ion and also electron diffusion process. So as long as you not understand this one, and then we all understand already. In fact, for fast charging, it's related to important parameter. It's one is lithium ion diffusion. Another is electron ion diffusion. As long as you make these two process fast enough by this kind of suitable material design, it really do help improve the performance. So this is the one we went to risk and hope us understand. And then here I outline this kind of few important parameters, like this kind of shorter solid state ion electron diffusion lens, rapid electrical chemical process, facial ion transport, and low resistance electrical network. All these parameters will help to improve the rapid charging this is something the one in terms of principle. So once we reach the principle, then we need to really design how have this kind of bit suitable or better performance in this kind of fast charging. So this is something the one one examples very important materials cho choice. We have tons of materials you can choose, but not all materials are suitable for the fast charging and the discharging process. It's a very fast fast charging one, and then. We start from these two materials. One is titanium based, this kind of this, this kind of the materials. This is something one we are really used for the last seven years to really keep using these materials. Although it's simple, it's abundant, but a lot of this can kind of be And another material we're also looking on group is about the high voltage castle materials, because this really promises the potentially enough voltage output, especially this kind of high voltage systems. And then this will, this will automatically, this will increase the energy density. So this is something that one of the couple material design thinking parts and also the design principle to help us to adjust how do you choose the suitable material systems. So let's start from one material system, the titanium oxide materials. This is something that one is widely used and also very, you know, it's this, I mean, we developed by different group already from material synthesis, from this kind of electrical chemical characterization. And also we are really fully agree already for this kind of materials, there are some disadvantage, but advantage is also very clear. High rate capacity, very good high safety issue, and also suitable this kind of capacity, but you need to really, it's very compared compare to this kind of commercial graphite. And also very good discount kind of structure integrity. Only about 4% volume expansion if you compare with other kind of electrical materials. So this really provides possibility for long life stability usage. 
So this is something we start in point. But the problem is the performance when you fabricate the device is very difficult homogeneous to systems, especially for electrical parts. And always use a lot facing a lot of problems. So that's why we develop a new type of this kind of stirring, it's kind of hydrothermal process. Here we call stirring hydrothermal approach. In fact, this is a previous speaker mentioned already this kind of hydrothermal approach. It's something more very easy to be really accessible by the chemical lab. And also, in fact, we use it. But what the difference to the, the normal, here we call static approach. The normal hydrothermal approach, you just prepare all the sample, put this kind of, in this kind of like, um, autoclave and put it all when we go for this kind of reaction. And then you don't deal with insect. This is here we call it static. Another one, we put one magnet inside, okay, magnetic bar inside this kind of uh, autoclave. And then with this kind of magnetic stirring, this will increase this kind of reaction process. So in this case, it's, you really increase the reaction and also maintain the reaction condition. All the same, in this case, the uni you can generate uniform morphology product in a larger scale, as we see here. So this is the one in a larger scale we can really produce in this kind of like, TiO2 titanate electro in this kind of like, metal materials lab. So for this kind of titanate, titanate materials, it's really homogeneous with 500 RPM. You can see this is like a gel-like materials. You put it there for a long time, it will not precipitate. And then it's kind of a sparky like sparky like, like structure. Very long nanotube structure. So this is about more than 30 micrometers. So this is something like length in the way how you get it. And then you can see the reaction, in fact, involved two processes for this kind of mechanically driven growth ultra long nanotube structure. One step is diffusion limited. It's more about this kind of TL2, this kind of dissolve, this kind of dissolve. And then the second step react to this kind of surface reaction limit. So these two reaction parts control this kind of overall formation of this kind of the nanotubular structure of the TL2 nanotubular structures. In, the, in a way, the solution, if you dilute a bit, it's more or less like milk. It's very homogeneous. You can put office, we, in fact, one sample putting office for more than two years, still very homogeneous when you don't have this kind of so-called precipitation lab. So because it's such a stable structure, when you're coating this kind of electrodes, it will not aggregate. In this case, we'll get a performance. It's very good performance compared with this kind of, without this kind of stirring. Without the stirring structure, the electrode performance is dramatic, dramatic decay. But for our electrode, this is a blue curve one. So this is kind of stirring structure. So when you go for this kind of heating and you, you get a TL2 structure, TL2 B phase structure, it goes to this kind of electrochemical performance. Although we increase this kind of rate, of rate but the performance decreased, but it's not decreased so much dramatically, okay, compared with other kind of, um, without this kind of stirring performance. And this is something one is really, it's this start about, for us, it's about seven years ago, really give us, oh, this something really can be really different for this kind of stirring structure. And then we also do this kind of performance for this kind of long time stability testing. For this kind of electro, when you bet this kind of structure, the electro, it really can go for this kind of flood. Long time, we go for this kind of 20 C, this kind of flood, charging discharge. This is very fast charging, less than 30 minutes. We can run in more than 10,000 cycles. The performance, extremely good in this kind of long time stability or at ultra high charging rate. So this is something where we got it. And then furthermore, Yeah, something that for my side is not really good. Okay, and then this is something that individual performance you can get for the electrodes. And I just mentioned already, in fact, this is something like a stirring. Stirring structure, it means we can tune the stirring rate. You can see here, I'll give you examples. We can tune from zero, 300, 400, 500, even to 1,000 for a different stirring rate we can really give you a different kind of aspect ratio of this kind of like nano triple structure. So this is something one we can observe, achieve. In this case, we use a different kind of stern rate, okay, different kind of RPM, this kind of electrodes. We fabricate a series different kind of structures. 
And Claire, it seems as the audio is okay now. Some people say maybe audio is get interrupted. It is okay. Yeah, keep going. It's okay, right? Yeah, because the way I, I can see attendee chat said it's not okay. Good. And then the performance is very can be really maintained. It can tune it. It can, can be controlled. You can see here. Well, this is slides here. So this is something run from very low rate. CO5 means five hour charging discharging. The performance for the zero RPM to the 1000 RPM, the performance is not so much difference. But if you go for the low rate, you can see for about 30 C. Now performance is much different already. You can see a lot of decay for without, without stirring, the performance almost goes zero. But for stirring structure, we still maintain pretty good performance. But this is something that one remind us, is it just a stirring problem? Is it a stirring rate problem or some other parameter? So, and then we'll find, in fact, the stirring rate, the highest stirring about 1,000, but that doesn't mean they have a better performance. The best performance is about 500 RPM, 500 RPM. So that's why we ask ourselves, what's the reason? And then we further really optimize, and then we find, in fact, the RPM is really correlated with a correlated with a span ratio. Okay, see, if for the span ratio, we can really build this kind of curve now. We have this kind of capacity, a span ratio, and also fast charging capacity. This is something one have this kind of three D plot for a span ratio, for high span ratio, for you can see for high span ratio about high span ratio here, the performance decay, but the decay performance. It's much, much slower for the lowest aspect ratio. So this is something that one give us confidence. As long as you tune structure, you can really improve your electrochemical performance. So this is example evidenced by our TL2 nanotube structure. The higher performance have an under the same fast charging charging rate, have a best performance compared with a lower performance, lower risk aspect ratio. So this is something that one the conclusion we can make it. And then for the moving on, for TL2, this kind of for the materials, we always say, oh, this is something we want because the surface storage, this so that's why and, and under this kind of for the performance, maybe have a better this kind of for the surface storage and then have a better fast charging performance. And then, in fact, the answer is not really true. You know, for the surface, this kind of for the TL2 the structure, there are few contribution. One is the surface storage, one is the back storage. But even in the surface storage, there are two kinds of surface storage. One is non faradic one another is faradic And then before that, people really dis didn't distinguish faradic with non faradic distribution contribution. And then we use this kind of synchronous actual absorption. We are first time really can tell you what's contribution in this kind of surface storage and the back storage in this kind of theater, theater fast charging storage performance. So this is something one we can really measure this kind of blood. TL titanium valence state by this kind of uh, expert assumption spectroscopy. And then during this kind of charging discharging capacity, then we can really get, let's go on the next slide. So this is even more of this kind of data, how it looks like. You can see the left side. For left side is our discharging data. We can see, we can really measure this kind of valence. But this valence change is independent of the rate performance. Whatever how high rate, you can see it's always under this kind of linear curve. Go through this kind of, uh, again, the data is not very really clear to me for screen. And then from here, you can really contribute to really tell us if we go for valence change at zero. That will be our contribution in this kind of non faradic capacity. So in this case, we can derive it. The non faradic contribu capacity contribution is about 18.2 milliampere hour per gram. So this is something one first time we really, really can quantify have this kind of observation. And then as a result, for you can see the middle curve. For a middle curve, we can really under different scanning rate. Now we can have a different kind of contribution. Like. First one is non faradic one, in terms of, kind of the green curve. The second one is a kind of pseudo capacity. The last one is about diffusion limited. So this is more about this kind of back storage. So this is the one how we can really distribute or really quantitatively for three part contribution in this kind of TL2 materials, how they can build. Okay, so this is something one, I would say is very, also very interesting for the community to hear. And then one more issue about fast charging. 
for fast charging, we all know already, it's built for have this kind of reaction polarization issue. The more fast charging, it means the ions is very difficult to diffuse inside. It's more about surface parts. And then this will be leading this kind of like reaction polarization. And then we, we use this kind of like one dimensional fixed second law. We can really solve this equation. You can see for the increased charging rate, if a high polarization issue, once a part of high polarization issue, then leads to a serious problem decrease the performance. So this is something the one we really think of. Now how the material design can reduce such polarization. So this is something the one our concern also. Reduce, I will not say disappear, it's reduce very some reaction polarization. So in this case, we go for one material design. We know already during this kind of charging process, okay, this air will diffuse in, in this direction and in from top view, okay? They say it will diffuse from top direction. And actually from bottom. So this is something during charging process and then have this kind of process. So in this case, we know already in the bottom contact close to the current collector one, ideally you more prefer this kind of electron conductivity. And then the one contact with electrolyte parts, you more prefer this kind of like ion conductivity. So this is something one, two kind of performance you need in this kind of electrodes. You know, traditionally, we don't think about, we just have this kind of coating. We make homogeneous coating. So that's why we ask ourselves a question, whether we can really tune the ionic and electronic conductivity in this kind of one electrodes. In another means, in, when the contact with the current collector, more electronic conductivity, contact with electrical parts, is more ionic conductivity is possible. And then what we do is, we mix our TL2 materials with graphene oxide, reduced graphene oxide. So for reduced graphene oxide, it's more electronic conductivity. For TL2, it's more ionic conductivity. We use layer, layer, layer by layer deposition with different kind of composition to tune such capability. So in this case, we have three kinds of electrodes we can fabricate. One here I call upgrade electrodes. Upgrade electrode means close to a current collector, more electronic conductivity. It's more graphene on top. The middle one is more homogeneous, it's a traditional homogeneous, but still multivariate structure. Another one is a kind of upconverted, kind of, this is like, one is in the kind of, one I call upconverted, another one I call um, downconverted, uh, downgraded electrodes. This is upgrade, sorry, this is upgrade, this is downgrade. The, the C is downgrade electrodes. So in this case, it's reverse process. In this case, out of, out of low charging process, the performance is not much difference. Of course, the downgrade electrodes performance is not good, but for upgraded and with homogeneous, there is no much different. But at the fast charging process, then you'll be different. You can see the middle part, okay? For the middle part, it's about 20C. For upgraded electrodes, have best performance in the blue curve, but for downgrade electrodes, lower performance. And then the middle one, the red curve is our homogeneous electrodes. So this is exactly how this kind of segmented grid electrodes can really help for fast charging process. Although the materials compositions exactly the same for ABC, for three electrodes, the, num the number of this kind of materials is the same. The only difference, the spatial contribution is different. Okay, this is how our material design thinking to help improve the fast charging lithium batteries. Okay, so this is something to again give you more Quantified data is about this kind of like lithium ion diffusivity for upgrade electrodes. In terms of this kind of like diffusivity, is much, much higher than this kind of homogeneous and also higher than this kind of like downgrade electrodes. So, this will give you another evidence. I, I think I give you the last example. Yeah, you time limitation. I give you the last example. It's about the puke, puke effects, effect. Okay, so this sums the one. Um, we give you this kind of pure effect. For this pure effect, in fact, this is something like one is well known already in a lead acid battery. So this study more than 100, 100 years ago by German this uh, German chemist. At that time, they used the pure constant to quantify this kind of like fast this kind of charging capability, especially can read, predict the read performance. In a similar case for our TL2 material systems. 
we also can really give you this kind of flow. Pucus read constant. Okay, see for us, for example, here we can distinguish the pure TL2B phase have a pure constant. The pure constant is about 2.1. And then for the pure identity TL2B phase, the TL2 phase is only about 1.3. So this is something one for Pucus constant. For Pucus constant, tell you is the lower Pucus constant have a better read performance. Okay, so that's why now you can see for the entities have better read performance compared to TL2 performance, if you initially understand it. But based on this one, we can follow two is we have mixed of these two examples, and then fun, we can even lower down the pure constant to 1.2 by the simple composition between entities and the B phase. So this is something one in the way we can do it. And then this is something one, at least we can really quantify use a particular con con constant to quantify this kind of uh, fast charger performance on this kind of materials. But of course, this kind of characterization still can apply with other kind of materials to really quantify this kind of real performance in those kind of materials parts. Okay, so this is some, something I would say the way we, we make it in, a, in turn TL2, but of course we also develop other kind of material system for MLS2, I think I just stopped, um, I, I, I was trying to go a bit fast to really, in, in fact, we had different different material system, but I think time limitation, I would just, Jump over, go to, go to a bit of fast. <clears throat> I said I want to go to the last part. Yes, so this is something very important part. So every time we hear a lot of news, talk about breakthrough into this kind of battery technology, but I always want to mention. In fact, we always about in academic parts only one particular part, maybe. The electrolyte, maybe this kind of anode or cathode and so on. So this this is very important to take notice is this and battery is really kind of system problem. It's really system problem. You can see we must start from different angle from lens, you can see from this kind of pico, it's a kind of autonomous structure, go to this kind of battery packaging, centimeter, right? So this is something kind of whole system consideration and also involve this kind of physics, materials, Chemistry, engineering. The same case for fast charging design batteries. It's also the same. I think we really involve different kinds of scale, especially because we are working a lot of this kind of, towards this kind of larger scale fabrication. So now we know, understand, it's always going kind to of trade off it's during this kind of engineering process. So this is something I want to remind everyone. It's not always one performance that means improve whole systems. And if anyone interested for this kind of material design parts, you can re read this reference. We have specifically to highlight this kind of fast charging battery performance, how it can improve by this kind of material design. And also now we are preparing another review now to summarize all this kind of material design, especially how we bring all together one, how we quantify to really compare it. So this is something we are on the way. Hopefully you can see this review paper in the next year. This is something we are, we are working on. Finally, I would say still a long way to go in terms of this kind of engineering parts, but the science part is maybe pretty clear now. And then hopefully, thanks for my speaker, I mean, my students, I mean, my students, they work very really hard and also really smart. The way they do really inspire me a lot and the way how we really push this kind of boundary in this kind of research, especially in how fast charging these and battery parts. Finally, thanks for everyone and welcome to Singapore after this kind of like pandemic period. Okay, thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions you have. Okay, so a very interesting and great talk. Thanks, Xiaodong. And uh, now we, uh, it's a time for questions. And the Xiaodong, please look at the uh, questions from the, ten, the audience. And there are already uh, three questions. So uh, the first question, uh, uh, it's asked if we need to choose between seven net particles and platinum net particles for a labor a imaging for bi biological tissues as culture or genes. What is preferred and why? Well, this is not related to silver net. Yeah, it's more related to the bias. Uh, by stuff, possibly <laughs> need your paper, I think. 
Maybe you just uh, want to certain summarize and uh, then I, go to yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. But Siva, frankly, you know, we are we are we know this area, and you know, I, I cannot really address this question about this kind of bioimaging parts. So they mentioned about seven nanoparticles, platinum table particles. Yeah, I think I I cannot comment this one. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, because this is really not my field. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So then we go to the second question. Uh, how can we reduce the contact resistance of editable supercapacitors? This is the first yeah. this is the first and also the following one question or another question, how can we improve the comfort of available devices? <laughs> okay, not related to this topic. Okay. Anyway, so for the editable editable supercapacity, yeah, definitely you need to really have tools like contact resistance. It's always you know you make sure you use this kind of good, this kind of hollow resistant materials. So this is the way how you can really reduce your contact resistance. You don't have other options, choice. But of course, this is always due to this kind of engineering process. And how to improve the comfort of variable device? Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is something that one also not in this topic. And then for comfort, comfort variable device, definitely is really kind of important, especially in variable device area, electronics area. And then there yeah, are a lot of people different do it different way. And what we are doing now in our group is we try to develop this kind of conformable device. It means when you attach it to skin, when you stretch your device, or you stretch your skin, the device also stretch. So this is the way it will improve your comfortable variable device. This is something one, of course, now today, we always make, mix with this kind, of very, this kind of flexible, with this kind of rigid structure. So this is something one we talk about flexible hybrid this kind of component. Again, this really depends on what you want. It's really, it's really good for the design parts. Okay, so due to the time limit, maybe we uh, answer the last question. And yes. uh, it's related to, to your, this talk uh, closely. Which component do you think is the biggest limit factor in your fast charging batteries? Oh, so in fact, this is a re I would say this is a very good question. But I would say there's no biggest limiting factors. Always all are very important. As mentioned in the uh, 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 last, last part, right? For the battery parts, in fact, it's a very system problem. It's not only one part. We always hear about you know, very good performance in this kind of electrodes. In fact, you can see our previous slide. Our electrode performance is very good. But the question is, the system performance is not as good. So that's why you know, electrode parts good. That means the whole system is very good. So that's something I want, want to highlight. It's all a problem. You have an electrode problem. You have an electrolyte problem. You also have a lot of packaging problem. So this is something one I would say is no one parameter. It's really kind of a systematic problem. And during this process, it's always trade off. You don't have one make sure all are good. So that's why you know I would say uh, I cannot really say it's only one limit limiting factor if you go for a real device. Okay, so uh, in fact, there are some other questions. Yeah, please, uh, you, you can uh, discuss privately. And uh, okay, so the, uh, this is the last uh, speaker. And uh, Sheldon, thank you again very much for the talk. Uh, okay, everyone, uh, it is close to the end of this symposium. Uh, I'd like to say we want to thank all three speakers for their great speeches. And uh, also, I want to thank all of you for the attendance. Uh, thank you very much. And now it's time to clear again. Okay, so Claire, please. Thank you, uh, Hui Sheng. So I just uh, wanted to say a couple of words at the very end here. Um, we have two more exciting events coming up that I'll like to tell you about. But first, there are several people that I need to say a big thank you to. So first of all, as Hui Sheng said, Thank you to all of the speakers for sharing their research with us today. I, I learned a lot and I really enjoyed the session. So we're so glad that you could join us for this celebration. Thank you to Huisheng for moderating this event and to all of my colleagues from across Wiley who are working behind the scenes to make sure that everything runs as smoothly as possible and that we really were able to get the word out about this. I'd also like to say a special thank you to our Asian Chemical Editorial Society partners. 
So Chem Nanomat is proud to be co-owned by this association of 12 different chemical societies from across Asia and the Pacific. And we greatly appreciate their support and the opportunity to represent them in the international chemistry community. As you can see on this slide, there are also many different platforms that has helped us spread the word about the event. And I'd like to give them a thank you as well. Um, in particular, if you're watching from China, make sure to check out our new Wiley Chem WeChat page that just launched a few weeks ago. So you can see the QR code there. So that's gonna have highlights from our chemistry journals. I think many of you already know the material science advanced science news. And last but not least, thank you all for attending. Uh, it was great to, to see you all here and participating in the chat and joining in. And then next, as promised, I'd like to tell you about two more symposia that are coming up soon that I'm quite excited about. First up, later on this month, we have a talk on a topic that I think is important for the entire scientific community, and that is taking care of your well-being in the competitive research environment that we're all a part of. Registration is already open for this, so we'll put a link in the chat, and I would encourage you to check that out. In addition, if I go to the next slide, um, all three journals that work together with the Asian Chemical Editorial Society so that's Chem Nanomat, Chemistry and Asian Journal, and the Asian Journal of Organic Chemistry, are collaborating on an event that's going to be highlighting early career researchers, because we really want to connect with people at all stages of their careers. We recently launched early career advisory boards, and we've invited one member of each of these three boards to come speak in September. Um, they're all going to be talking about topics broadly related to organic materials, so I think that's also a good fit for people who came uh, for several of the talks today. So keep an eye out for more details on that early September, but we're still setting the exact date. And last but not least, I wanted to remind everyone of the other anniversary celebration we had planned this year. And that is the fifth anniversary board member collection. So if you haven't checked that out already, um, if you click on the document icon in the top right corner of the auditorium, uh, there's a link there so you can see some of the, the contributions that our board members made to that collection. So thank you all for coming. With this, I will close the session, and I hope that we can all welcome you again at one of our future events. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.